Many of you might have a difficult time imagining me in a security guard's uniform. You would, but that's actually what I wore for a number of months in 1995 from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. as I tried to work my way through grad school. At seminary, I was able to work for this security firm, and most of the time, the nights were not that bad because my main station to work security was actually at a yacht club. That's right, I just sat in this little entry booth and as the yacht club owners would come in during the night, I would confirm that they belonged there and I would push my little button and the arm would come up and I'd let the cars through. That was the predominant way that I was a security guard. Unfortunately, there were other duties that I found myself having to do. Because not far, in a town called Dwajak, there was this big factory that created die-cast metal parts for Ford Mustangs. Can I hear an amen from the men? (laughs) And more often than I cared, whoever was supposed to work Saturday nights at this die-cast factory in Dwajak, Michigan, would call in either sick or a no-show. And so I would get this last-minute phone call, and because I was desperate for money, I would say yes. And also because I didn't have a date, I would say yes. (laughs) And so I would go out to work at this factory. Now, you have to picture this. It, it, it It was several warehouses, huge warehouses, about as big as you can imagine. And inside these warehouses were these great big vats, much like swimming pools of molten metal glowing in the night. These vats, were positioned to where the aisleways were kind of in a grid pattern between them. Metal catwalks on the second level crisscrossed all over as well. It was something like you'd see in a really scary action film right at the climax. As I would be walking through there on my rounds, I had strapped across my chest with a a, a leather strap this round device. I don't even know what it was called. Basically, it was a leather encased round device that looked like a canteen of some sort. But it simply had an old-fashioned keyhole right toward the bottom. And what I was to do was walk from station to station in order. And when I got to the specific station, up on a little ledge, they would have a key. And on the key, it actually had a little typewriter number associated with that actual station, I would put it into the keyhole, and I would turn it. And the act of turning it would strike against some typewriter tape, which would also strike against this reel of paper that, like a clock, was unwinding as the night went on. That way they could tell if I was just sitting in the office or not. (laughs) But imagine with me, if you can, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., especially around 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning, As you're making your way through a loud hissing and surprisingly clanking warehouse, the hissing so loud you really can't hear anything else, pools of molten metal bubbling, the sounds of alarms going off when a furnace fell below 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine walking through these dark aisleways, and suddenly someone walking perpendicular right across your path. Like me, I hope, many of you would find that your knees had lost all sense of up or down, and your legs would lose all control, and you'd find yourself falling backwards. I hope that's what you'd do, because that's what I would do. Here I was, armed with nothing but a flashlight, in these huge warehouses. And I would ask myself at times like that, when I would get so scared, I would ask myself, why are you so afraid? And I'd realize, because it was the fact that I felt all alone. Just me, who was my backup? A flashlight was my backup. I felt all alone. Maybe you uh, have asked somebody out on a date, maybe recently, and the fear grips you. Will they possibly say yes? 
to me spending all of my money to feed you and give you some entertainment? Will they possibly say yes, no? They'll probably say no. And sometimes you ask them and sometimes you don't because you're afraid. And the few times that they say yes, you always ask yourself, why was I so afraid? And you realize it's because you felt all alone. When I started pastoring 1993 in Burleson, Texas, I was the assistant pastor, and about every third week, I was scheduled to preach. And many of you won't believe me what I'm about to say, but just ask anybody from the Burleson Church who was there from 93 to 95 about this assistant pastor who would get so nervous when it was time to preach that he would get tunnel vision. I couldn't even read my manuscript. So I would try to memorize my manuscript. And then I would get up and have a seven-minute sermon stumbling around because I forgot my manuscript. Many of you are praying that I was that nervous today. (laughs) My throat would dry out. And annoyingly, I would be clearing my throat and, and coughing, and the deacons would bring me little tumblers of water. But my problem is when I get really nervous, my hands shake. Are you the same way? My hands shake so bad that when I would try to take a drink to, to stop my throat from being so annoyingly dry, that uh, the, the tumbler would shake so much that the water would all come out and fall on my suit. And so I would put the water back. And I would go home and I would ask myself, why are you so afraid? And I would realize it was because I felt all alone. Today is a very special service. It's our memorial service, our tribute to those of us, our loved ones who have passed away in the past 12 months and have gone on into the loving arms of Jesus. Many of you have been specifically touched by the individuals represented by the pictures that we're going to show at the end of this service. And many of you look at this time of your life with fear and trembling because that one who brought stability, that one that you just always knew was there, is no longer. And you have some fear and you ask yourself, why am I so afraid, and you know the answer. It's because you feel so alone. Today, as we take a look at Scripture and see what Jesus says about this fear and about this loneness, I'm going to take a look at what Jesus might say to us if he were to come visit us today and share events from his past. The event that we're going to walk through is the Scripture that Pastor Randy Spire uh, uh, excuse me, not Pastor Randy, Richard uh, just read moments ago. It's the story of Jesus calming the storm. But to understand the story of calming of the storm, you need to understand how did this come to be? What happened just before? What's the context? And if you read scripture, especially Mark chapter 4, it lets you know what happened to create a situation where Jesus falls asleep. He's exhausted. Well, he has every right to be exhausted because if you read about what he had just been involved in, it shows that he had healed an entire town. He had healed a leper. He had remotely healed the centurion's son. He healed the fever of Peter's mother-in-law. He even cast out an entire crowd worth of demons. And he preached from the back of the boat right at the edge of Galilee. And at the end of that day, he was deservedly tired. And so he says to his disciples, come on, let's get out of here. And so scripture tells us that they took him just as he was, which it means that they decided instead of pushing their way through the pressing crowd on the shoreline to go get a bag of provisions and a change of clothes, they said, okay, well, let's just go now. And they pulled up anchor and they pushed their boat out and they set sail across the Sea of Galilee. Scripture also tells us that many from the crowd who had their own boats there jumped into their boats. And other people who begged their way and stowed away on other boats, they, they followed along and, and awkwardly followed this magic man named Jesus, like the first generation of paparazzi.
Jesus makes his way across the sea. Now, something you need to understand about the Sea of Galilee, it's about 13 miles long and about eight miles wide. And it is known, even to this day, for very severe and very consistent storms. Storms are not a new thing. And this was not a unique thing for the Sea of Galilee. Surrounded by mountains, the wind will blow through a trough-like opening and begin to swirl over the Sea of Galilee. And that's why gospel writers will describe this and other storms in Scripture with terms like a cyclone, a tempest. Matthew, in the telling of this story, in his version of the story, he describes the experience of being on that boat during the storm with the word seismos. As he tried to figure out what was it like, and he looked through his Greek thesaurus, he found the word seismos. Now, many of us here already know what seismos means. In fact, many of us are amateur seismologists because we live in Southern California. We know seismology is a study of earthquakes. When trying to find just the right term as an eyewitness to the account of being on the boat during this storm, with the crashing of the waves and the boat filling up, Matthew decides to call it an earthquake. He only uses this term two other times. The first time he uses it in his writing, other than this place, is when he describes the earthquake that took place at the crucifixion of Jesus. The second place he uses it is at Jesus' resurrection. The first he uses to represent what happened right when the forgiveness of sin came to mankind. The second, when resurrection and eternal life. Could it be possible that this seismos, this shaking, also holds great power within the story as well? Jesus, being exhausted, says, let's go across. And so they go across, even though Jesus knowingly directed his disciples into a great storm. Many of you today know exactly how that feels. Because you not only feel like a storm is coming, maybe you feel like a storm is going right now. And maybe this storm of yours has gone on for more than a year. Perhaps you feel like you are in the act of perishing in that storm right now. You can know if you are feeling this way by maybe some phrases that you've said lately. Have you possibly said, I'm drowning in debt? My house is underwater. I can barely keep my head above the water. I'm trying to tread water. I have this sinking feeling. I'm all washed up. If so, you probably feel like you're in the midst of a storm right now. Scripture tells us that a storm arose. Unfortunately, when you're on the boat with Jesus... It's not always calm. It's not always beautiful starry nights. Sometimes a storm will arise. Scripture tells us that while this storm was crashing waves over the boat and and the thunder was clapping and the boat was filling with water and these disciples are becoming more and more convinced that they will die that night. It says that Jesus slept. In the back of the boat, in the stern, on a cushion, he slept. Let me ask you a question. How exhausted do you have to be that a bucket of water to the face will not awaken you? you got to be pretty exhausted. Can you imagine having buckets of water repeatedly thrown on your face while you're on a log ride that never ends, never stops plunging into the water during a rainstorm? That's close to the experience of what Jesus was going through at the back of the boat. And yet he slept. What did Jesus know that allowed him to sleep? Maybe you're tired even today because in the midst of your storm, over the howling winds of the storm that you're going through right now, maybe it's a big decision about your employment. Maybe it's something with your family. Maybe it's something with your relationships. No matter what it is, In the midst of the storm, you've been crying out to God, Lord, help me. 
and you feel like God is asleep at the back of the boat. What do you do when you feel like God is asleep in the midst of the storm? I'll tell you what the disciples did. Mark records probably the words of Peter. He says that the disciples came to him and said, don't you care if we perish? The, the syntax of this actually says, don't you care? We are in the act of perishing. We're dying here. And you don't care. You're sleeping. They yell that to Jesus. These seasoned sailors. Sailors who had all this 10,000 plus hours of experience. Professional sailors. Ask a carpenter for help. Professional sailors who knew the riggings of the sails, who knew to ha- how to handle the oars and the rudder. They ask a carpenter who made tables, who did your kitchen cabinets, who crafted your chairs. How desperate do you have to be as a sailor to ask a carpenter to save you on a ship. Jesus' hands were callous, but they were not calloused by the riggings of the boat. They were not calloused by the oars of the boat. They were calloused from carpentry. How desperate do you have to be to throw all of your hopes to a carpenter? Interesting thing is it becomes obvious to us in this story that in order for them to have true hope, They had to lose all hope in their own professional abilities, the things that they had prided themselves in. And in that moment, when you stop priding yourself in your own ability, you truly can throw all of your hopes into one who has all of the ability, but from the looks of it, is ill-prepared. They cried to him, Lord, don't you care? We're in the act of perishing. And Scripture says... That he arose, in fact, the, the syntax for the term of how he got up is the same type of syntax as if you yourself got up in the middle of the night, abruptly walked to the back door, opened it up, and told your dog to stop barking. Same syntax. He, he awoke abruptly, stood up, and in our translation it says, quiet, be still. But Jesus is not that boring. The words that are recorded in the uh, fourth chapter of Mark have Jesus saying, silence, and keep being silent. And then he turns it up a little bit more by saying, put a muzzle on it and keep it on. That's what scripture says. Be silent and keep on being silent and put a muzzle on it and keep it on. In other words, he turns to this incredible storm this mega storm, and he says, thunder, stop your barking. Waves, stop your biting. Put a muzzle on it. We're done with you. And instantly, the storm ceases. The waves turn to crystal, silent ripples on the water. The rain dries up. It is silent. It is still. And Jesus turns to his disciples who are frozen in the moment. And he asks them the question of the day. Why are you so afraid? You still got to work on your faith? Why are you so afraid? And he turned and he went back to the stern of the boat, squished his waterlogged cushion, laid his head upon it, closed his eyes, and began going to sleep again. In this stillness, the disciples frozen with a new fear. In fact, Scripture says they feared a great fear. Whereas just a couple of sentences before, it said they were afraid of death. Here it says there is a greater fear than death. They stood there frozen with a fear That is not of death, but a fear of being in the presence of a God who is not afraid of death. A God who controls all of creation. They had seen him do the magic. 
They had seen him heal people. They had seen him cast out demons, but now they see him as the one in charge of all creation. And they stood there frozen. Silence, except for the sound of droplets falling from their hair, falling from their beards, falling from their sleeves into the still water that had gathered in the boat. And somebody, probably Peter, it was in his nature, somebody breaks the silence and asks the question, what kind of man is this? All this time they had seen Jesus as being capable of doing all these other miraculous things. And in this moment, they feared a greater fear as they stood in awe and realized the power and magnificence in Jesus Christ. Which brings us some questions today. The questions that they had to ask themselves, frozen with fear in the boat. How many times do we need Jesus to calm the storm before we can comfortably ride in the boat with him through another one? Do we always need Jesus to calm the storm in order for us to stand in awe at his magnificence? Or are we just simply riding in his boat because We're trying to have a life of calm instead of a life of conviction. If we are in his boat because we think he will sail the ship around the storms, we are sorely mistaken because he's been known in the past to direct his disciples directly into storms that make professional sailors cry. But let me give you some hope. As surely... As Jesus Christ could not sink with his disciples in that day, he certainly will not let you sink in this day. The fact is, if you're doing the Lord's business, he will not let his business sink with you. 1929, J.C. Penney was under so much fear and stress. His company was not doing well, and he worried himself night and day until he got so sick that he developed shingles, an ailment that truly is excruciating, some of the most excruciating pain you can experience. Checked into the hospital, they gave him tranquilizers to try to help him. But despite the tranquilizers, he could not stop worrying about his failing business, and so the problem persisted. It continued to get worse until finally one night he was sure that he would die. And so he wrote some letters to his wife, to his son, knowing that he would soon pass away. That next morning, as he awoke, he heard a hymn coming from the chapel, which was right next door to his room. And the words to that hymn came wafting into his room, no matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. And he leaned forward in his bed, and he asked the question, could it be? Could this be true? And as quickly as he could, he got up and he walked into that chapel. And as he walked into that chapel, he became part of a miracle that day, a miracle of healing. As he realized, Why was he so afraid? He was not alone. And today, I want to ask you the same question. Why? Despite the storm that's brewing around you, why are you so afraid? You are not alone. You serve a God who will always be there to give you hope unlimited. 